Hi, everyone. This is Catherine Baer with River Network, um, and I'm here with Lisa Ronald today, the Wild and Scenic River's 50th Anniversary Coordinator, and wanted to welcome you to the webinar. Um, we've got about five minutes before it starts, so thank you so much for getting on early, and um, you will all be in listen-only mode, and we will get started right at the top of the hour. And for any of our speakers, if you're not speaking yet, you can just mute your line as well manually. Hi everyone, it's Catherine Barrett River Network again. Welcome to the webinar. We're going to wait till 2 o'clock and get um, as many people as we can before we get started. But we've got a great lineup for you today, four speakers um, talking about different opportunities for um, celebrating and building on wild and scenic rivers. So we will get started in just a minute. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is right at 2 o'clock, and we've got a great presentation for you today, so we, and a full one, so we are going to go ahead and get started. This is Catherine Baer. I'm Director of Science and Policy at River Network, and wanted to just welcome you to our webinar today, and you've got some basic information about um, how the webinar, this go-to webinar works at first. So you're welcome at any time to fill out the chat box for questions. We will be monitoring these questions throughout the webinar and make sure we try to get to them all if at all possible. Uh, the speakers will also be presenting their information for follow-up with them, any of them directly. So just to get us started, um, before I hand it over to Lisa Ronald, I would like to give a quick introduction to River Network. Um, this webinar is co-sponsored with the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th um, group who is working to promote the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th anniversary and plan and help groups coordinate events all over the country. So we're really pleased to be working with them on this webinar series. Our next one will be in early June, and the sign-ups are already available on our website. So for those of you who don't know about River Network, we are a national nonprofit organization. We just are celebrating our 30th birthday, and we essentially help 
state and local watershed groups all around the country to be both more effective um, as organizations and more effective in, in their science and policy work to protect and restore their rivers at the local level. And so that means we work on a range of issues such as clean water, drinking water, wild and scenic rivers, um, green infrastructure, and we think probably over the years have worked on almost every water issue there is. Um, but really connecting people to each other, to resources, and sponsoring convenings, um, and training people on how to have strong organizations and achieve their goals for clean and healthy rivers in their communities. So thanks to many of you who already are River Network members. We super appreciate it. And um, we have a membership structure where you could join, become a free member, and just come to enjoy the resources we provide, like webinars like this one. If you decide to become a paid member, you then get access to premium training webinars and things like 25% off registration for our upcoming River Rally Conference, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and also discounts on consulting and finding funding for water restoration projects around the country. So again, thanks to many of you who are members, and if you're interested in supporting our organization, you can find out more at the link below. Finally, I just want to talk about, before I hand it over to Lisa, sort of our um, overlap with the Wild and Scenic Rivers area. So we're doing web webinars like this one um, in collaboration with several of you. And then our upcoming River Rally, which is in the end of April and beginning of May in Lake Tahoe, California this year. It moves every year. But we also have a very specific meeting about Wild and Scenic Rivers that will be on April 29th. So I hope that you will consider, if you're interested in this presentation, there's going to be uh, both a pre-meeting plenary panels, and a number of workshops about wild and scenic rivers. So we really hope that you will consider joining us if you haven't signed up already. And so you know, early registration goes through um, COB tomorrow um, on Friday. So register now. And then the other thing we've been working on is my colleague Sam Cohen, who's on with us today, has been working on an assessment of wild and scenic River, sort of the, the needs of groups around the country so we can better help um, support coalition work with our partners, American Rivers and American Whitewater, um, to make that happen. So if you're a group working on Wild and Scenic Rivers and ha haven't talked to Sam already, his email is right there, and I'd love to have you reach out and, and talk to him. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to hand it over to Lisa Ronald, who is the coordinator for the 50th anniversary. Um, work on the Wild and Scenic Rivers and is going to be introducing our great panel today. Thank you so much, Catherine. And um, I just have a couple of slides here myself. Um, we have gr four awesome panelists um, that I'll get to in just a minute, but just want to make you aware of our upcoming webinar, uh, which is on June 4th. Again, we, we have another four fantastic panelists. Um, so the June 4th webinar will talk about engaging your diverse community, so engaging students, involving uh, Latino communities, engaging with veterans and outfitters. So a, a great lineup and the um, link to register is on screen. You can register on the River Network website under um, the webinar section as well as from our Rivers Toolkit on rivers.gov. So if you haven't visited our toolkit, this is a great resource to help you plan events, to help build community around the river restoration, stewardship, and advocacy work that you are doing to make sure that you have what you need to leverage this anniversary to support the local work and the local community building that you are doing around rivers. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce um, our first presenter. So Sam, if you wanna hand the screen over to Meg. Um, so Meg Kruger works with partner agencies and urban school districts across the United States to align classroom content with outdoor learning opportunities through Wilderness Inquiry's Canoe Mobile program. She coordinates land and water programming for Canoe Mobile in visits uh, from Oakland, California to Portland, Maine. So Meg, um, love to hear about um, your uh, information for the group. Wonderful, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little more about Wilderness Inquiry and Canoe Mobile and uh, talk about some of the program offerings that we have that can help amplify communities' efforts to celebrate the Wild and Scenic River 50th anniversary um, and share a little bit about what we're doing currently this spring. So before jumping into to all of that, I'll give a little broad introduction to Wilderness Inquiry and to 
the programs that that make up our organization. So Wilderness Inquiry, we're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. We were started in 1978 by our current executive director and founder, Greg Lace. And our mission is to connect people from all walks of life to the natural world through shared outdoor adventures. The history and background of how we started actually happened relatively organically. Greg was not anticipating starting a nonprofit when he was 22 and had just graduated from the University of St. John's in St. Cloud, Minnesota. However, that was about the same time that the Minnesota legislature and our governor at the time, Wendell Anderson, who was featured on that Time uh, news article front um, cover, there was legislation language to establish the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, which is a space in the northern part of the state that borders Canada and the Quetico, made up of uh, neighboring lakes and, and land bodies. And the, the Minnesota legislature was establishing it as a protected area for canoeing and, and uh, non-motorized watercraft. In doing so, they wanted to pave and motorize big pieces of the Boundary Waters in order to make them accessible to, and the language was, the handicapped, elderly, and women. And that, and so, in order to, in order to do that, they, they would have, uh, it would have disrupted major parts of that protected area. So Greg, with a few of, of his community members that he knew through his sister, brought several people up to the Boundary Waters, uh, two with paraplegia and one with a visual impairment along with a couple of his other friends, and they did a five-day canoeing trip. They camped and canoed and portaged and paddled and everything that one would do in the Boundary Waters and photo documented the whole experience and submitted that as testimony to the legislature. And along with a lot of other efforts, it overturned that language to pave and motorize those pieces of the Boundary Waters in order to make them more, quote, accessible to people with disabilities uh, and the elderly and, I suppose, because it was the 70s, women also. And what's interesting about that is that it may have been a very progressive way of the uh, of our legislators thinking about making the outdoors accessible and making them um, available to everyone. But what Greg's vision was is rather than rather than adapting the environment to fit the need of the participant, we adapt the approach to the environment in order to fit the need of the participant. So we started the very earliest beginnings of wilderness inquiry were about social integration, bringing people together who have different abilities, who have uh, who have different experiences, who are of different ages, different body types, different backgrounds, and bringing them together in an outdoor opportunity and an outdoor adventure where there's a bit of an equalizer happening. So our adventure, adventure is our medium, inclusion is our method, and integration is our mission, uh, and we've been at that for about 40 years. A, a just brief. Um, a brief overview of the the programs that we run and the and the people we serve. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. That's a park ranger, um, and she is rappelling in. I think it's Utah, but I'm not. I I always forget to uh, double check where that photo has taken place. But that's in the 80s. That's one of the only photos of the time. It's one of the only times that that has ever happened where um, someone who uses a wheelchair was able to rappel down a uh, uh, a mountainside. So in 2017, Wilderness Inquiry served just over 37,000 people, 36,000 of whom uh, were a uh, person with a disability, and uh, almost 19,000 of whom were people of color. We have 575 adventures and, and events that were part of that of those numbers, so people coming out in groups of maybe four or five if they're going on a, a long extended trip or maybe 200 a day if they're coming out on a youth programming canoe mobile event, which we'll get into as one of the uh, one of the main programming methods that we have for reaching lots of people in urban areas um, and connecting with both partners and waterways. So among our programs, that's a, that fourth uh, and final bullet point, we have our what's called the Share the Adventure Program, which is extended trips throughout Minnesota, 
nationally. We go to Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks. We also run international trips as well from Belize and Costa Rica to New Zealand, Iceland, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda. And those are available and part of our the fee-for-service model that we have where people who are coming on those trips who can afford to pay full price, their, um, their contribution to their experience provides scholarships for people who can't afford to pay the full price for it with the price sharing, um, a price sharing model. Additionally, those funds go to support our FIT trips, which are families integrating together, where uh, uh, several family units will come together and match them by, by ages so that kids can have some uh, chance to play amongst each other and parents can have a chance to connect and, uh, and full families can have a chance to connect in the outdoors with a guided experience. Our gateway program, uh, which is designed for individuals with cognitive disabilities to have an experience in the outdoors that has a bit more support than one would find on a share the adventure trip. And then the idea is that after they participated in a gateway trip, they have the familiarity and the comfort um, and the confidence to then go and uh, participate in a share the adventure trip, perhaps internationally uh, or outside of, of the area where they live. The final program and our most recent one is our canoe mobile program, and this is the one that I'll spend most of the uh, most of the webinar speaking about. Our canoe mobile program is our truly our youth engagement platform and the introductory experience that we hope to provide for so many people as a way of beginning the that 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 journey into being an outdoor enthusiast, an outdoor recreationalist, or potentially having a career in the outdoors as we talked to a lot of our, our youth participants about. So in 2008, Wilderness Inquiry partnered with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and the National Park Service to take 10,000 Minneapolis and St. Paul youth on the Mississippi River, which is the ar arterial waterway that runs right through the heart of the Twin Cities. It's a national park unit, the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area which made it a, a great opportunity for us to forge and, and, uh, and really solidify a partnership with the National Parks, the National Park Service. That program then grew and took on a, a touring program, similar to Bookmobile, which is why it's called Canoe Mobile, which Bookmobile, of course, brought literacy to rural areas and, and in the form of a portable library. Canoemobile brings outdoor education and outdoor literacy to urban areas and urban waterways across the country. So here's a shot right below the Golden Gate Bridge of our Canoemobile crew and our rig, which is the van and the boats and the trailer in San Francisco uh, as part of this touring roadshow model that, uh, that Canoemobile has grown into. So by, by physical centerpiece definition, Canoe Mobile is a van and a trailer with six of our Voyager canoes, each of which seat 10 people, and then our staff that travel around the country with Canoe Mobile, providing those experiences to different communities. Canoe Mobile partners with agencies and organizations to, to harness the educational programming that they have so that they're coming out to programming as well. Youth are getting on the river with, or on the waterway with Wilderness Inquiry, with Canoe Mobile, and then on land having, experiencing enriching educational activities that, um, that, that pair along with the experience that they've had on the water. Canoe Mobile is in about 40 communities annually, and of those 37,000 people that Wilderness Inquiry served in 2017, about 30,000 of them were youth and community members through our Canoe Mobile program. So to, to dive in, there's a couple of ways that Canoe Mobile looks when it, when it arrives to an area, but um, this is the sort of the, what, what main, mostly happens. So our staff greet you. This is a little bit youth oriented, and there's other ways to engage as well, but you're divided into our boat groups. You get fitted with a paddle and a PFD. Try to make it look pretty nice. It's a, uh, it's a uh, some people are very comforted by, uh, by color. Then you, regardless of your 
of your experience canoeing or your experience on waterways or that waterway, everyone receives a safety talk and everyone receives a paddle lesson. And then we load the canoes and we paddle. Now, we've been to about 40 communities. Um, here we are on the Delaware River with Camden, New Jersey on one side and Philadelphia on the other. This is a youth engagement day. Uh, we've been to Philadelphia for about the past four years. This is the Mississippi River, uh, just north of the Twin Cities. This is in the Northwest Indiana area. This is Hobart, Indiana. And we still have a, um, a, a mission to, to work with people of all abilities. And uh, this individual uses a wheelchair and we've transferred him into the canoe and uh, gave him a one-handed paddle and made it work. This is an iconic scene at Aquatic Cove in San Francisco, California. Our crew is actually out there today. This was a photo from 2016, but our current canoe mobile crew is programming in this exact spot today. They're out there with a group from um, a local San Francisco high school. On the other side of the, co the, the other coast, this is the Atlantic Ocean. This is Jamaica Bay in the Gateway National Park Unit in New York, Brooklyn. So there are several different options for a way that Canoe Mobile can plug and play into your community. There's a youth engagement day where a school group is, is brought out for an experience paddling and several experiences on land with educational activities. That's a very common way that we interact with groups. Often our programming happens on the shoulder season of the summer, so March, April, and May, and September, October, and November is when the canoe mobile tours. The summer is prime canoeing and outdoor activity season in Minnesota. So the, all of our rigs and all of our staff come back to the Twin Cities and they run our high season summer programming here. In the spring and in the fall, we go out when school is in session and work with schools and local agencies to bring youth out for uh, a day on the water. Another way of, uh, of, in of including Canoe Mobile in your community is through a community event. So this, in this way, often there's an existing event that ha may happen near a waterway, um, perhaps an art festival or a, um, or a community event. We've paddled along with, uh, with Easter egg hunts or with um, summer the jam, summer outing, fun engagement, um, the, uh, the National Outdoor, National Outdoor Day uh, in September is another way that we've um, been involved in communities. And with this, people come and they don't need to sign up ahead of time. We don't know necessarily who's going to come, but they can arrive and take a short 20-minute paddle just to see what it feels like to be in the canoe with people that they already know. And then they arrive back on land and move on with, uh, with their day or with whatever else is happening. And then we also have fundraising and promotional events where organizations could get stakeholders or, uh, or community members out for a gala that happens on their waterway um, with, we can serve wine and, and cheese in the boats, um, or it could be a race. Every year we have a great river race where people buy a boat and then they race down the Mississippi River against other people and those those funds, those donations come back to support our canoe mobile programming. So a little bit, a few pictures about what that looks like. These are, this is again on the Delaware River. This is a youth engagement day. So we have groups that are on the water paddling and then the kids on land, we're working with National Forest, the U.S. Forest Service and National Park Service doing outdoor uh, land-based activities that were water-related. Here we are in White Rock Lake in Dallas, Texas. This is part of a, um, of a community event that was already existing. It was an Earth Day event, big, um, big, it's a, a big event there. And we brought people out ahead of the conference for a pre-conference paddle uh, that happened down there. 
the Trail Creek, Michigan. This is a, um, a one of the the things that happens during fall days are sometimes less than ideal conditions for weather, but we provide ponchos for everybody um, and give folks a, a chance to get out on um, on a creek. So this is a very small waterway. The Mississippi River, of course, is a very big waterway. Our, our boats are pretty adaptable for um, different kinds. This is a, another youth engagement day at the Zumbro River in Rochester, Minnesota. These students were doing a water unit, so they came out and in canoes tested water from their boats and then brought it back on land and did some um, data analysis with the samples that they had collected. This is a community event um, on a nearby, it's a, a chain of lakes in the Twin Cities. This is part of uh, an event called Water Fest. So there were lots and lots of partners who came out and were presenting on different things and had different kinds of activities. And, and Canoe Mobile was one of those activities that anybody who was attending the, the um, outdoor activity the whole day could participate in for free. Um, they just needed to receive that short paddle safety talk and, uh, and be willing to get in the boat. This is in Detroit on the Detroit River. Here we are in the, on the Chattahoochee River in Atlanta. This was last November, and we were working with uh, Chattahoochee Nature Center, and they brought out their board. So this is, the, this is their board and some of, their, um, some of the friends of their organization to see what it was that the students who were coming out to Chattahoochee Nature Center were getting to experience those two weeks that Canoe Mobile was in town they got to have that same experience uh, and it, it, helped, it helped reaffirm what it was that Chattahoochee Nature Center is doing in, order in, in terms of engaging the youth in their community with that waterway that's so close and so important to the ecosystem and the, um, and the economic development of that area. They were able to show that firsthand to their, to their board um, and also give them uh, you know, a, a fun and exciting opportunity after work. This is one of our big wine and cheese events. This is a fundraiser. This one happened on the Mississippi River where uh, people come out and they, in our boat, have an evening paddle with some uh, snacks and, and refreshing libations. And it's an opportunity, again, to engage at sort of a different level. Um, our, our executive director, Greg, likes to say, why buy a table when you could buy a boat? You can have your whole uh, your whole gala out as part of Canoe Mobile. Again, here we are in Washington D.C. Uh, we have a lot of friends and partners out there, so we try to offer as many opportunities for the people who work so hard to help us coordinate events for youth to offer them an opportunity to come out into the boats as well. This is on the Potomac in D.C. We also spend a lot of time on the Anacostia River, um, both in D.C. and in Bladensburg, Maryland, that neighboring. City. And here's another partner paddle in Chicago on the Chicago River with our uh, a lot of our friends from the Southern Lake Michigan region, both federal, local agency partners here. So the youth engagement, which is one of the again one of the the strongest ways that we engage communities, the our core competency, Wilderness Inquiry, is really good at offering a way of really getting on the river, of getting 50 people on the water at one time. 54, technically, is the, um, is the capacity with our six boats of youth and chaperones that could be on the water at one time. Now, often, a school classroom or a grade is more like 100 or 200 students, so we partner with local educational providers, whether those are state or federal uh, or local watersheds or other educators in the area. And while 50 of the group are paddling, another 50 or so are on land rotating through activity, educational activity stations. That could be water quality testing that's often provided by local watersheds. Uh, EPA has come out to do that as well. Watershed modeling is another way I, lo I love her. The cultural history of that area. This is, a really, this is one that we really rely a lot on our local partners who have that knowledge. We know about 
rivers and we know about safety and we know how to get people outside uh, and and paddling and having a really good time. But those those cultural pieces, the um, the academic pieces, that's where the expertise lies with local agencies. And so if we're able to engage 50 at a time while then three other local agencies are engaging 15 at a time and they're rotating through their activity stations, the end user, the student, is receiving so much information in just one day that relates well back to their the, what they're learning in school as well as connecting them to the place where they live on the water that um, that provides life for their for them and for their their area. This is a great one, learning about river sports. And of course, team building and learning how to work together. That happens pretty organically in the in the canoes, but also as part of uh, as part of their their day. Learning about their waterway. We also try to encourage our partners to talk about their careers and what brought them to their their area and, and their area of expertise. Then they have fun as well. So wrapping up here, in 2016 and 2017, Wilderness Inquiry visited over a dozen major cities, and then there were another dozen more rural, less major cities. And we also travel within these areas to, to places throughout. So the Chicago area stretches really from um, from Waukegan all the way to nearly Gary uh, in the in that in that region that we're able to program. In 2018, we are currently in our spring tour. The crew is finishing their day in San Francisco and then they head throughout the Sacramento area to Galt, Lodi and Orland and then Salt Lake City and they'll they'll wrap up in Grand Ma Rapids in uh, in in the middle of May and they come back here for programming and we are in the process of planning our fall 2018 tour and this is sort of the plug-and-play opportunity for anyone on the um, on the line or to anyone who, who learns more about this we are uh, we, we will run a tour this fall and would love to be involved in your celebration and your activities um, interested to, to talk more and if you are interested in learning more please contact me. That's my phone number as well as my uh, email address. Happy to talk about how we may work together here to um, get people out in on these waterways um, and, and connected to the, the things that are so important. So thank you so much for, uh, for your time and I will, uh, I'll pass it back to Lisa to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Meg. Lots to think about. So let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Teresa Huck, who attended her first Wild and Scenic Film Festival in 2008. Uh, this was a life-changing experience for Teresa and brought her to work with the Wild and Scenic Film Festival team. Uh, she brings a lifetime of a sales experience and as a social entrepreneur, uh, her goal is to use the Wild and Scenic Film Festival on tour as a voice for change. So Teresa, go ahead and tell us more. Hi everyone, I'm having a difficulty getting my slides up here. Um, I <laughs> think it might be good to put someone ahead of me because the screen disappeared and I'm on someone else's computer, I don't know. So, would that work for yep, you and then I can chat? That does. Yep, let, that does. So, actually, Trevor, if we can just go ahead and move you up in the lineup and, um, Teresa, we can work with you offline. Um, so, uh, Trevor, Trevor Croft started his rafting career in 2002 and is the founder of Rafting Magazine. From expedition boating to helping new people coming into the world of rafting, Trevor puts his media skills and passion to work developing initiatives like online learning modules, helpful articles, photo journals, destination guides, and adventure films celebrating the awe and wonder of rivers throughout the world. So Trevor, um, go ahead and tell us more. All right, thank you so much. Um, one second here, I was... Uh to pull up my notes but um so this year uh rafting magazine is doing our wild and scenic 50th anniversary film series and kind of at its core it's a uh, celebration of wild and scenic and a celebration of uh everything that the river touches for different people so um there's a lot of different aspects to it 
And I'm sorry, give me one second here and I can get right into that. So our first uh, part of the film series is that we are focusing on amateur films. And we feel like amateur films is a really important aspect of, uh, of this whole Wild and Scenic because we want to see how it touches people's lives and how it affects people. And it's really the people that make Wild and Scenic what it is. Um, so these amateur films, we're, we're trying to get different people from the city to, to get different, uh, just get those films out there, get people excited about rafting and excited about kayaking and all sorts of different aspects of use. So the reason we focus on film is, uh, and I really like this infographic for a lot of reasons, but it shows just how often people from Gen X to Gen Z watch videos on YouTube. Um, it, you can see, you know, Gen Z will watch videos 70% of the time they're watching a video daily on YouTube. And uh, Gen X, Gen Y, 49% uh, for Gen Y and 37% uh, for Gen X are watching videos daily. So we're seeing a lot of people who are getting a lot of engagement off of videos. And I feel like this is really important. YouTube uh, provides a great outlet for this, and this is where our video series is going to be hosted. So you'll be able to go on to our uh, our YouTube channel and check out these different wild and scenic videos. Now, with the huge amount of volume that people put into watching videos and, and touching their lives, we felt that um, one of the critical areas is user-generated content. Now. I could flash up a bunch of different statistics about it, but uh, suffice it to say, if you are looking at content, say you're scrolling through a Facebook feed or something like that, um, you could see a really cool article on there by um, Time Magazine or National Geographic, or something of that nature. But what's more likely to catch your attention is your friend's video from, say, just their weekend out, maybe uh, paddling or hiking or uh, walking their dogs. I mean, those are the most common sort of videos that, that people share. So they get a huge, huge amount of, of traction on social media and online in general. So our goal this year is to really focus on the user-generated content. Um, and part of that comes to our next point is community support and rallying support for this. So from that user-generated content, our model is to take a bunch of videos, curate that from the community, and get those out there so that we have one place where people can see all these videos, they can keep coming back to it, and really uh, showing user bases like, this is what wild and scenic means to me. So one of the ways to rally support for this is we, we found lots of paddling groups throughout the United States. And there's boating clubs pretty much every river um, you could think of. And they could be uh, canoe groups, they could be kayaking groups, rafting groups, and um, one, so one thing I'll talk about a little later is the Feather River Festival. And the Feather River Festival is started by a group called the Chico Paddleheads. And the Feather River Festival, um, we'll get into it again later, but at its core is really a celebration of a lot of the advocacy work that happened on the Feather River. So having these paddling groups, these are the kinds of folks that are most likely to generate uh, user-generated content. And the way this helps is if you have a small festival or you've got um, one of your uh, events that's, that's happening, it's helping to build support for it. So reaching out to these paddling groups really, really gets that user-generated content going. Uh, these folks, most people who are out boating or enjoying the outdoors will have GoPros and um, their cell phones, they could be out canoeing and uh, you know, just have a camera with them, shooting photos, shooting video. These sorts of things, again, are the things that really get people excited about wild and scenic rivers and about the 50th anniversary. So um, again, for your uh, groups and for your events, we wanna tap into these people to try and, and really get a hold of them. Um, one of the next things that we're reaching out to, uh, commercial outfitters. Commercial outfitters, of course, generate a ton of content and there are commercial outfitters on wild and scenic rivers throughout the United States 
And the cool thing about this is that commercial outfitters, well, A, they want to be seen, but also they are part of the story of Wild and Scenic and how it helps to touch people's lives. For a lot of folks, uh, their first experience on the water is with a commercial outfitter. So going with a commercial outfitter and seeing it for the first time, they need someone to guide them down the river. Naturally, they reach out to that outfitter and they'll want to take their GoPro, they'll want to take their cameras, they'll want to take their cell phones on those trips. Commercial outfitters have people shooting photos on the side of the river. So commercial outfitters have a lot of content that helps to show what wild and scenic is, what it means to different people. And I've talked to a lot of outfitters on a lot of different rivers and also a lot of people who are in other sort of uh, maybe non-outfitter groups, but they, they are uh, out there to help people get on the river uh, serving people with disabilities. And those people also generate a ton of content. And you can really see how taking someone with, with disabilities out to a place that's, that's well outside their comfort zone, um, that really touches someone's life. And when it's involved with a wild and scenic river, that creates a really magical experience for not only that person, but the, the people that uh, share that boat with them and share that trip. So our next uh, aspect is other river users. And Wild and Scenic isn't just about rafting, and it's not just about kayaking and not just about boating. There's a lot of other people who are out there using the river. Um, for instance, this, this climber right here, he's out there in a river canyon. Um, just below him is the river, and he's climbing straight up from there. So Wild and Scenic is going to be touching his life as well. So everybody from hikers, to climbers, anglers, trail runners, mountain bikers, equestrian users, all of these different groups, uh, they all use wild and scenic rivers in different ways. And uh, there are different protections in place on different wild and scenic rivers, different wilderness areas they might be in or might not be in. Uh, but these people all have the opportunity to go out to these rivers and experience the rivers in different ways and, and touch uh, each other's lives in different ways. For instance, when I was a, a kid growing up in the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas, uh, my dad would take me out and we would go fishing together all the time when I was a kid. He loved fishing. He was a fishing guide. And um, that was one of my memories as a child uh, with my dad going out uh, fishing with him, exploring wild and scenic rivers, going up to the North Fork of the American in California and um, going to these crystal clear pools. And I mean, it made me fall in love with rivers in a way that I didn't know until I was an adult. But uh, those sorts of interactions can help um, drive wild and scenic forward. And all of these people, again, they're taking their cell phones, they're taking their cameras. Media has never been more accessible than it is today. So uh, from there, this is where we have our, um, we're building experiences and building more of that user-generated content for folks to really enjoy and really, really get that impact out of. Um, so that comes to increasing our voice and how do we, uh, get this out there and get people excited about it and get people talking about it. And part of the way that we're integrating the 50th anniversary of Wild and Scenic is a, is a lot of branding. So tacking on the Wild and Scenic logo to um, all of our content that is coming out of Wild and Scenic Rivers, we're going to be putting that on there so people can see it, people know it, people have that brand recognition and, and think, wow, this is part of the, the celebration. And since people consume social media content so much nowadays, um, also having targeted hashtags of hashtag make your splash, um, those, those sorts of things really help to increase that branding and really help to increase that recognition of, hey, this is all about wild and scenic and getting people excited. And this is kind of uh, the path that we're using. So having these out there, if you have events or, that are going on on wild and scenic rivers, um, using this hashtag on Instagram or Twitter or using the branded content, that's going to really help people think of it. And then also integrate that for your use on different rivers. Again, here's some content we use uh, for Instagram. And we had that on there. This is a picture, one of my favorite spots in, in any river I've, I've been on. This is the North Fork of the American River. Uh, the wild and scenic section called Giant Gap. Uh, it's about a two mile hike in, and then you have to raft down uh, 14 miles of, uh, starts out with class four or five, and it's super steep, really inaccessible gorge. But this place is a place of huge impact to me, and 
So adding that branding in there saying, hey, look, this is all about Wild and Scenic. It's all about make, hashtag make your splash. This is what gets people excited. This is what gets people really engaged. And then they know that that content all lives together and keeps that branding on point so that we all can um, see that on different social media platforms, share it together, and link it back to our Wild and Scenic uh, film series, but also help integrate that with other festivals and other river users to get more excitement built for Wild and Scenic. So that brings me to the Feather River Festival. And um, Feather River Festival, just a little more background on it. Again, it's, it's about partly the Wild and Scenic designation, but also partly restoring flows to the, the uh, Feather River Canyon. And this was, uh, this festival was put on by American Whitewater every year. And American Whitewater uses this festival as a celebration of the restored flows on the North Fork of the Feather uh, below Rock Creek Dam. Well, the class, uh, excellent class three, four, and five sections of the river there. Um, the whole big festival. Uh, they do a film series as well, and um, they also celebrate the, and this year especially, the designation of the Feather River, which is uh, one of the eight original uh, designated rivers for Wild and Scenic in 1968. So this festival has a huge impact on a lot of local boaters. Um, it's, it's basically kind of the uh, end of the season in the local boating community. If you're from uh, any, pretty much anywhere in California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, we got boaters from all over the place, even as far as Idaho and Montana. I've talked to boaters who have come out for uh, Featherfest to just be excited, be out on the river, and uh, get really stoked about what Featherfest is all about. Um, this is shot from the Class 5 section during uh, the Class 5 Tobin race. And this sort of race draws a lot of people in. Um, and it's great because this whole section of river where the festival is is roadside. And a lot of people come out, they watch the races. Um, and even in the last few years, I've seen more boaters um, and, and also more people who are interested in boating but don't necessarily boat. People are bringing their families. Um, You'll have kids lining the banks watching boats go through, and it's a huge, huge just level of excitement and level of intensity that, that comes with this, that, that people are out there really focused on the river, really excited about what, um, what the Feather River Festival brings and, and what it means for all of the boaters in the area. So again, part of this is the media aspect of it, and from that media aspect, we are taking our Wild and Scenic uh, Film Festival and we're going to be integrating it a bit with Featherfest. So as I mentioned before, there was there's a film festival uh, every year at Featherfest and that's on Friday night during the festival. And this film festival shows all sorts of aspects of boating and um, different, different people and different experiences. And this year we really wanna get that experience of Wild and Scenic into the festival. So some of the best and highly rated films of our film series uh, are going to have the opportunity to be selected by uh, the Feather uh, Fest Planning Committee to be included into the Feather River Festival. And so that's going to get that inclusion from online videos and user-generated content and bring it back to the Feather River Festival and bring it back to Wild and Scenic. And this is kind of how we, we're pulling this all together with uh, the Feather River Festival. So there's three pillars of Wild and Scenic that our films are going to be focusing on. Recreational, of course, you know, all these boaters out there enjoying the river, enjoying their time on the water, uh, different kayaking videos, different rafting videos. Um, and as I said before, you know, there's a whole variety of river users out there who get to experience Wild and Scenic and it touches their lives in different ways. And so part of the films that we're trying to solicit from people are recreational. And of course, these are going to be the most common ones because, of course, boaters love to have their videos shown and um, be going down the river and see people um, and share the river with other, other folks. The next pillar of Wild and Scenic that we feel is really critical is the natural or ecological part of it. And, you know, the, especially with the Feather River, the rugged terrain in there, it, it resisted development for a lot of years and has a really special place in terms of uh, 
geological qualities, um, wildlife qualities, and uh, all sorts of ecological ways that the river touches people's lives. And again, this is this is one of those things that I think people really, really respond to is getting outside of, of cities, getting outside in nature, and just enjoying all those aspects of that. And even if it's a casual float trip down a you know very calm part of a wild and scenic river, these are the sorts of stories that we want to focus on is how does the natural aspect um, affect you as a, as a person and you as a, a boater? And um, how does it interact with wild and scenic to really get people excited and really bring that home? So the final aspect of wild and scenic, and especially with the Feather River Festival, is kind of the bottom there. I have a picture of uh, Ishi, and he was, um, he was one of the last of the Yahi people. And these fo folks were living up in the Feather River area, um, kind of in the early 1900s. And they, that group of folks ended up with this development, and it, it's kind of a long and, and complex story, but the story of Ishi and what uh, he went through at the hands of development and, and things like that were one of the incredible aspects of Wild and Scenic Rivers because he lived along a Wild and Scenic Middle Fork of the Feather. Um, again, one of those rivers that was part of the original uh, designation. But in California, too, and a lot of other places, there's a huge amount of cultural impact that happens, not only to uh, in indigenous peoples, but also especially in California, gold mining was a huge, huge thing. So uh, we want to see stories about this. And wild and scenic rivers uh, touch people in these ways as well. They change our culture. They change the face of how we interact. And now, especially with recreation becoming such a big aspect of the world and, and the outdoor industry, seeing that and how it touches our lives and changes our culture and changes the way that people interact with wild and scenic that is really another part of the story that we're trying to capture. So these are all kind of elements that we are integrating into our film series and that we want to see from our film series, and as well as that user-generated content that's really going to help. So uh, if, if you guys have questions about um, how this film series integrates and how it uh, can interact with all of this, then uh, you know, we would be more than happy to talk about that. You can check it out at uh, raftingmag.com, and there's a link. Um, on the side, that'll take you to the Wild and Scenic Film Series. We'll be posting all of the uh, updated films, and then all of the films will also be hosted on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you guys uh, have a festival and you want to integrate some of that, um, or you see a film that says, hey, wow, this really sticks out to us and, and works well for kind of the message we're, we're trying to put out, feel free to contact us, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with uh, the film uh, producer and so that uh, you guys can get on the same page and, and work together on that. So um, thank you so much for your time. And, and Thank you, Trevor. Awesome. So I think we'll bring Teresa back in. Um, Teresa, it looks like we, we've hopefully dealt with your, um, your technical issues. Um, so Teresa will be telling us uh, a little bit about the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. So um, Teresa, go ahead. Uh, so, Teresa, I think you're still muted, so we need to unmute Teresa. Ah, I'm here. Great, Teresa, we can hear you now. Thank you so much. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for being patient with my technical issues. So I'm going to jump right into this for the sake of time. Um, many of you know the Wild and Scenic Film Festival, and I'm um, sort of using this as a platform to introduce myself to you and also um, help share why I think Wild and Scenic Film Festival is so um, valid and pertinent to your organizations. So let me start with this. Wild and Scenic Film Festival is not just a collection of film shorts. It's actually a real emotional experience. I attended the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in 2008. It was my first time. I live in Nevada City. And uh, 
it was an awesome experience in that what um, what came to be was I had no no environmental consciousness at all. So I'll say it like this: I was resistant, and I saw a film in this film first festival called Bagot, and Bagot was about single use plastic. And as I was leaving the theater, I noticed that everyone, and I mean everyone, was carrying these uh, stainless steel water bottles and coffee mugs. And I thought to myself, well, I can do that, you know? So I, I bought um, stainless steel water bottles and coffee mugs for the entire family and every friend that I could possibly imagine. And... Uh, I, you know, started telling everyone about single-use plastics and how they were damaging the ocean and our rivers. And, and so, you know, that experience, it, it changed me. And I can, I can conservatively say now, I think that, uh, you know, when you take Wild and Scenic Film Festival into account and what we're doing with that, if the average attendance per program is 243 people, um, and the, you know, we're in 191 cities worldwide right now. That means that I have helped to bring these messages to over 46,000 people. So I really think it's safe to say that that one experience with Wild and Scenic in that one theater has actually made an impact in this world. And I, my film program or my slide program won't play on her Mac, so um, bear with my moving back and forth here. Anyway, while, uh, you know, it's important to educate and inspire action in your communities, we all know that if you're going to put on an event and you're going to do that kind of work, you want to know what kind of money you can raise with it. So I wanted to give you guys some statistics from our festival. The average um, first year to three year host um, raises approximately $3,049 in profit. Um, I do have, you know, many first time hosts too just in the last month that have raised 20 and 30 grand in sponsorships for their Wild and Scenic Film Festival events. And that was on top of this. So the idea here is to use Wild and Scenic um, not only looking to raise funds with the film program and the ticket sales itself, but also um, to use it as a new sponsorship engagement platform. So the other thing is membership. When I attended that first festival, they gave membership free with the ticket. And I remember the ticket was 30 bucks, but of course I had volunteered because my cousins knew how to work the system. <laughs> and I ended up getting this free membership basically because I volunteered for three hours. And what happened was I would see the emails of all the work that they were doing, the river restoration work, all, all of this stuff going on, um, where they're restoring, um, uh, what's it called? Riparian. I'm not, I'm not in river science, so bear with me. But the habitat to try to bring back, um, a healthy habitat for the salmon. And as I had experienced all these emails and started learning about the issues in my community, an email came one day asking me to renew my membership. Lo and behold, I did. And I had become a member of Circle from that point on. So, I will also tell you statistically that we average about 38 new um, uh, members per event on average around the country. Uh, so, you know, 38 new members, that's, that's pretty awesome. But, you know, I wanted to make sure that you knew there's a 72% rate of membership renewal at each event as well. So this is a great member engagement platform and new membership drive. So, let's see if I can make this big for you guys here. We've taken, and, and this quote, I love this, and I'm hoping you guys can see it. Um, this quote came in to Wild and Scenic, and it reminded me, we have taken as much of the work out of this event as we possibly can. 
you're taking on the role basically of doing promotion and outreach. And we're doing as much as we can to make that as simple for you. Our system has become really refined. For those of you that know Johan, our tour manager, he just keeps making it better and better. But it's gotten so refined. We had a gentleman at um, an organization in Oregon who had hosted a film pro program for years and had never used Wild and Scenic. And he reached out to us and we, uh, we set up a program for him and he called right after accessing our tool, excuse me, our toolkit and our online resources and said he had never seen a program as comprehensive as this. This was a guy who had done film programs at the university for years. So I really do feel that um, I can safely say to you that we take as much as work out of it for you and, and take that on ourselves. We do attract a pretty diverse crowd. Whoa, there it goes. <laughs> we do attract a pretty diverse crowd to Wild and Scenic. And it's funny, I was just having lunch with some tour hosts here in the Riverside area, um, and they were telling me uh, that they were blown away by the fact all of their events tend to bring in the choir. And they found that this Wild and Scenic Film Festival brought in a whole new segment of strangers, she called them, than they'd ever seen before. So it was really exciting for us to work with Lisa Ronald to create this kind of diverse film program that we felt would reach out well to the community and educate um, on the subject matter that um, we river keepers and water protectors um, hold so dear and want to communicate to the community. This program is really made to try to draw people like me, people that don't have any consciousness um, about the environment or what's around them. And they come to Wild and Scenic and they it comes alive for them. So I'm gonna run through the program briefly with you. Uh, the first film is A Letter to Congress, which, um, if any of you seen is just this compelling reminder that we have a duty to protect our public lands. Um, and then we move into A River's Reckoning, which is a story about the Colorado River. Um, then we adventure with some paddlers, pack rafting the Olympic Peninsula, and that is in Wild Olympics. And then we join Tim Palmer as he makes his way through the waters of Oregon's Wild Rivers Coast and that's protected uh, wild and scenic por uh, river portrait. And then we have Every Bend, one of my favorites. It teaches us the importance of the wild and scenic designation. And Chasing Wild gives you that adventure um, as three adventurers explore the devastation of the Mount Pauly mine disaster. And Grandad, the gentlest, sweetest touch of showing you how life should be lived. And um, River Connections, really great one, remind us that water is life. And uh, Nowhere also, you know, really giving us that activist touch of, you know, we have to fight for it. And then finally, we chose The Elwha Undammed. And some of you know this was a 2017 film, but we chose it because with this 50th Wild and Scenic Rivers, a celebration, we really, really agreed with Lisa that we need to remind our communities the effects that a dam has on an ecosystem and what happens when you tear it down. So you have a lot of choices when you choose a wild and scenic film program. You can go with this program that I've just highlighted, which is the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th Anniversary Film Program. You can go with one that's very similar uh, called Our Waters or we have you know, our best of the fest, or you can curate your own program from a library of about 140 to 150 films. So, I find that Wild and Scenic Film Festival creates this scream to the community where they are, they are calling out to you you know, are you doing that film festival again? Are you bringing that back? 
when we have hosts that host one year and then they skip a year, they end up going back to every year because this film program creates such an emotional journey that your viewers and attendees want to come back and they want to bring their friends. We do provide a whole lot of customizable uh, promotional materials for you. That's part of where we've taken the, the work out. We typically create a theme each year. This year is Groundswell. And we have all of the materials, posters, handbills, tickets, programs, all ready to go, plug and play. I mentioned our online resources. Um, this, this toolkit and the online resources that go with it is so comprehensive. It'll give you workbooks to plan out an entire film program if you wanted to do it on your own. It will give you access to all the filmmakers that created each film. It gives you every piece of material you could be looking for. Films separated by genre, by anything. <laughs> I, I want to close with this. Wild and Scenic Film Festival is a significant brand. Uh, we're well known. And it's a lot um, less risky to go with Wild and Scenic uh, rather than some sort of unknown or new event. So I encourage you, incorporate this in or create a signature event from this. You don't have to start from scratch. You really don't. We are a festival by activists for activists. And I think that's really important. Hosting supports our environmental uh, work as well. We are the South Yuba River Citizens League, a river keeper just like yourself. And, you know, we're doing the same exact work. So any purchase that you make that goes right back into circle and funds our salmon restoration projects, our river cleanups, uh, fighting the Centennial Dam. So that's an important and important element to me. Lastly, oh, part of my slide is not showing up on this Mac. I apologize. Um, I want you to know working with Wild and Scenic is a simple process. Uh, you simply apply. Uh, we, we make a commitment on a date and time. And then we walk you through the process of planning out the entire event. We provide national partner kits and everything you might need to um, create a, a real cohesive wild and scenic film festival event with your organization. So we'll go back to this gorgeous picture and say thank you very, very, very much. Um, you know, and know that we started off just like you. In 2002, it was two ladies at Circle that decided to start a film festival. And it was Oh, probably um, three years, we figured, after we had obtained wild and scenic status on the South Yuba River. 2008, it was when I attended, it was still a relatively small event. Now, it's five days long, 10 venues, two towns, and three sessions of film at every venue. So there is no limit, really, to what you can do with Wild and Scenic Film Festival. Thank you so Thank much you so for much. having me. Thank you so much, Teresa. And for those of you listening in, I'd encourage you to think through and type a question in for any of our three presenters as we move into our fourth presenter. Um, so Jennifer is the Ozarks Conservation Program Coordinator for the Missouri Sierra Club. She organizes and mobilizes Ozarkians and statewide Sierra Club members and supporters to protect public lands, uh, wild places, and water. Go ahead, Jennifer. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time today to talk about getting a 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act resolution introduced in your state. Um, in Missouri, we currently have two concurrent resolutions in our legislature, um, one in the Senate proposed by a Democrat and one in our state House of Representatives, which was proposed by a Republican legislator. So first I will, let's see, there we go. 
So um, first I'll talk a bit about the background and why we thought it would be a good idea for our state. Um, then I'll talk about how we got there and kind of the relationship formed. Um, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about why it's a good thing to take this on. So um, this photo that you see was taken at our leadership summit um, with the Sierra Club last October. We floated an eight mile section of the 11 Point River, which is our wild and scenic river in Missouri. Um, and it was absolutely spectacular, so. So the background of why we decided to ask the legislator to introduce a 50th anniversary resolution. <clears throat> well, in Missouri, we currently have four new state parks that have unfortunately been under fire by our current Republican administration. Um, as with many public lands issues um, within this administration, it's been a rough road. Um, and we have a governor who, who kind of sort of mirrors um, President Trump. Um, so it's been a rough road. Um, so these four new state parks were actually acquired under the previous governor, who was a Democrat, and they were acquired via settlements with companies who had releases of toxic material that ended up impacting the local areas. And via the terms of the settlement, um, they included restoration funds. And restoration funds can be used to buy land, uh, which compensates Missourians for what was lost due to the contamination. So our former governor, along with our DNR, um, bought pieces of land that were based on a 1992 study of ecological and geographical gaps in our park system. And, and needless to say, the Republican legislature was not happy that they weren't part of the negotiations at the time. And as anyone knows that's worked in real estate, most land negotiations need to be done quietly. Um, nevertheless, they were upset. So currently, we have a Republican-led governor and legislature. And uh, um, there were talks recently of selling off all of our new parks, which was a big bummer. Um, and fortunately, the Sierra Club was able to help stop that so far. Um, but now you're probably wondering what this has to do with the 50th anniversary resolution. Well, one of the four state parks, um, indeed the largest state park that was acquired is the 11 Point State Park. And it's on the wild and scenic 11 Point River. It's six miles of river frontage. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, and so there have been some local lawsuits filed to get it away from the DNR um, and to auction it off to local landowners, which would be a huge bummer. So we're doing all we can via grassroots power to keep the park, all of the parks, but especially the 11 point because it's the largest, um, because we see the value of this amazing state park on a wild and scenic river. Um, so in comes the 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Well, we sort of saw the resolution as a feel-good option to bring awareness to the 11 Point State Park, um, along with the fact that we should be celebrating such an awesome milestone. So how did we get to the point of introducing a resolution? Well, it started with building a local relationship. So back in February, um, a group of local Sierra Club members met with Representative Justice in district. Um, and Representative Justice covers uh, the Branson area of Missouri. And actually one of our other new state parks, Ozark Mountain State Park, is in his district. So while we talked to him, he committed during the meeting to protecting not only his new state park, but all the other state parks as well, recognizing that they were a package deal. And he also recognized, surprisingly to us, the ecological and economic value of the parks. Um, and the 11 point particularly is located in one of the most economically depressed areas in our state. So indeed a state park could bring a lot of wonderful economic activity to that area. So during the meeting, um, however, he had some choice words for the Sierra Club. He said, I don't like that you all are against everything. So, you know, instead of getting defensive, we had our group of constituents there and I said, yeah, you know, we're against a lot of things, things that we think are bad, like lead poisoning and seizing public lands, but, you know, we're for state parks and so are you, and that's a good thing. And so after that, um, the tone of the meeting really changed. And in fact, at one point, um, he lauded the Sierra Club for our work on the Buffalo River in Arkansas. And that meeting really changed the game because he sort of had a preconceived notion of like who we are and what we stood for, but meeting in person on his own turf kind of shifted his perspective. And of course, it's certain we won't agree with him on many, many issues, but at least on this, we were able to come together across the aisle. 
So a few weeks after this meeting, um, we were working on uh, a resolution to recognize the 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And we worked with the local U.S. Forest Service and we kind of asked their opinion, like, hey, do you think this is a good idea? Should we try and get this resolution passed? Um, and they agreed it was a great idea and they reviewed and edited our version. Um, and they added some wonderful things about community and just some great language, which by the way, I can send you all a copy of that if you would like to look at it. Um, but we asked Representative Justice if he would introduce the 50th anniversary Wild and Scenic Rivers resolution. And we didn't really expect him to say yes, since it was an additional ask from an organization that he doesn't normally associate with. But um, surprisingly enough, he moved forward with the resolution right away. Um, and actually last night, um, I just got word that it went to committee and it was voted, um, voted in 11 to zero. So it's on its way to the floor to be voted on, which is super exciting. So um, the key elements, I thought I'd just share kind of the key elements as I see it of getting a resolution introduced. Um, it's really important to diversify partners. Um, in this case, asking for the local U.S. Forest Service blessing and kind of requesting their input because obviously that's very important. They know, they're the ones that know the most, you know, about their wild and scenic river. Um, and then also kind of having their, their name on it when it's sent to the legislator really helps us, I think. Um, and so um, another one is meet on their turf. And when I say they, I mean the legislators. I think it made a big difference to meet with our legislator in district. We actually met him at his place of business. So it was really like on his turf. Um, but, you know, when you meet at the Capitol, there are a lot of outside pressures. And of course, if he knows, you know, the Sierra Club's walking in and another Republican legislator maybe is next door and sees that there's just some different dynamics going on. So I really encourage meeting with your legislators in district. Um, and then let your elected officials vent. Um, not only with him, but with a couple of other ones that we've met in district, we found that they sort of, they kind of want to beat up on the Sierra Club, which a, a lot of groups do. We're used to that. So you just kind of let them get through it and work through that. Um, and it ends up being a good thing. So, um, and then also keep your conversation positive and don't get defensive, um, obviously. And finding common ground professionally and personally. I know after our meeting with the constituents, I spoke with Representative Justice for a while. We talked about backpacking and kayaking and come to find out he's a, you know, great outdoorsman. Um, kind of maybe a Sierra Club person in disguise, uh, but I don't think he liked that comment. But uh, yeah, so it's really interesting what common ground you can find, even if you're working with someone that maybe has, you know, a very different perspective. Um, and then finally, just make make the ask without fear of rejection. Um, we totally did not expect him to introduce the resolution, um, but the fact that we actually have a Republican in the House of Reps that introduced the resolution and then a Democratic senator who introduced it is really cool. I mean, we're working across the aisle. It's something we can agree on um, that we need to recognize this event, but also to protect our rivers. Um, so that's a good thing. And then why should you get a resolution passed? Well, um, obviously there is the obvious, which is the recognition of this spectacular milestone of which it is. Um, you can also firm up your relationships with partners um, that, that really helped having kind of working with the Forest Service on a common goal. It was a really neat thing and it helped build relationships there. And then you can bring awareness to ancillary issues. In our case, it's the um, new state park on the 11 Point River that we hope becomes a reality soon. Um, and you can also build relationships um, with your legislators. So a resolution is a, it's a feel good way to bring awareness to your wild and scenic rivers. And it's a great mechanism to build relationships. And with that, that's really all I had in case, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to all of our speakers today. I think we've had a breadth of different perspectives, a lot of different information about ways that you can plug and play everything from outdoor education in to um, film festivals, to other sorts of film and media outreach, and then um, this notion of um, a statewide resolution. 
So um, I'm just going to go ahead and put um, contact information for all of our speakers on the screen, and I would encourage um, those of you listening to uh, contact our speakers as needed to uh, follow up with them individually if that's um, your choice. But we do have time for a few questions. Um, so if you have a question, please do type it into the chat box at this point. Great. Yeah, and this is Catherine Barrett, River Network. We've got one question that's come in. It's a question, I think, for Trevor. Is there, the question is, is there a deadline for submitting films to Rafting Magazine? So there's not a particular deadline on, uh, on that, but what we are doing is, um, we are partnering with some of the uh, film festivals uh, later on in the year. So ideally we'd want to have these in by um, as early as possible, but mostly before September. So August 31st would be kind of our ideal deadline to, to have that out. Uh, but we'll be doing it throughout the year. So uh, the earlier that people get films in, the more that they're more likely they'll be seen. So. Okay, great. So. There you go, hopefully um, that makes sure that. Any other questions? I know for Lisa and I have a couple, but any others from our audience? Only one I'm seeing right now. Okay. Well, here's a question. On the Wild and Scenic River Film Festival, how, um, how far in advance do you have to plan that out? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, really, we prefer 12 weeks. Um, we do have occasions where we can shorten it, uh, especially if you're choosing this particular uh, film program, uh, the 50th Wild and Scenic Film Program I'm referring to. Uh, we can then often shorten it to somewhere around the eight-week mark. I would say 12 weeks is ideal for planning any event in general. Okay, so at least the lead time of that, and so people can contact you there and, uh, and, and look at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival website as well to find out more. Exactly. And they can apply um, right there online if they like, or they can do that by emailing me at the uh, address you've provided. Great. And Teresa, I just have a I just have a follow up question for you, and I don't know if you mentioned this in your presentation, but can you give us um, just a, 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 an estimate of the number and breadth of different locations that uh, Wild and Scenic on Tour visits in the nation each year? Yes, I did actually mention that briefly, but in more detail, we are currently in 191 cities uh, around the U.S., Canada, and um, a few in Europe. And um, we, um, goodness, we calculated out that that came out to, many of our hosts will put on multiple screenings uh, or multiple sessions. Uh, we figured that that was something like uh, to the breadth of 232 film programs. <laughs> right. Another follow-up on that, we've gotten a question on, on the cost for the or price range to use the Wild and Scenic Film Festival as part of a festival. Oh, yes. And this program is a special deal that we did for $1,000 even. And we ask for a $250 deposit at the time you sign up, and the rest isn't due until two weeks before um, the event. So we make that as financially doable as possible. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come up before is, um, I think all of you touched on this a little bit, but so for any of our panelists, um, how do you go about engaging um, the out, outfitter community and sort of the recreational business? I know that's a big part of some people's outreach, and is there room and importance in doing more on that? Can you talk about that a little bit? I definitely can from a Wild and Scenic Film Festival perspective. We find that the outfitters tend to be the very best allies to, um, you know, the river keepers and smaller conservancies that put on Wild and Scenic. And they do that in a number of ways. Um, organizations like Patagonia, uh, their sales reps and stores can provide uh, grants on their Wild and Scenic Film Festival programs. Um, they will often sponsor many of the events that you put on. Um, then you have the independent outfitter stores, 
they will do this in partnership and give you all the proceeds. They will sponsor the event. They will, they will gladly take on any number of different roles. Yeah, I can answer a little bit of that on the, the Wrestling Magazine side, too. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Not at all. So uh, on the Wrestling Magazine side uh, of things, we tend to find that just uh, reaching out to the outfitters, a lot of outfitters, um, in terms of like, uh, if you're looking at different uh, ones that are on the river and and running river trips, if that's what you're referring to, those outfitters, um, it, it's pretty easy to reach out to either the owners or the um, or the marketing contacts. And those people tend to have a lot of media and a lot of um, just saved up um, content to, to kind of help out. And then um, usually they'll be able to put that out to their social media channels and through their, um, their mailing lists and, and things like that. It kind of adds a great other element to them if you could do a like a social media or digital marketing collaboration on that um, to make uh, their fans see that as well. So that, that often helps from that perspective too. Great, thank you so much. Um, so let's see, question on, so Jennifer, I mean, your approach on, you know, getting some formal recognition sort of a different type um, at the the state legislature is a really interesting approach. And have you heard of, or do you, are you working in other states? Um, and do you know that's happening if people want to get engaged that way? Or did, are you the first one to do, do this? I think we're the first ones. Um, the last time I talked to Lisa, because I actually contacted Lisa early on to see if there was like a template <laughs> that we could follow. Um, but uh, as far as I know, we're the only ones that have done it, but we would definitely be willing, like I could share the resolution with you all if you'd like to use the language. And this is okay, Lisa. I'll just speak speak very briefly to that. And um, yes, Jennifer, I think we've heard a, a handful of rumors of other endeavors that are that are similar that that are wanting to start. Um, but I think yours is most definitely the farthest along. Um, and uh, certainly, um, we hope to to see you succeed here very shortly and um, be able to post that draft, obviously, on our our rivers toolkit. Um, I will say, from the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act back in 2014, there were many states that ended up ultimately passing resolutions similar to this that were. Um, you know, uh, lauding the Wilderness Act and, and highlighting um, the values of wilderness in that particular state and that were these very feel-good, um, cross-cutting aisle sorts of endeavors. Um, so although I think, Jennifer, you're emerging with the, the initial rivers template, um, there is some other kind of wilderness material um, and people can contact me uh, if needed, if desired to get a hold of some of that stuff. That, some of that stuff is also online um, and easily available. So I think there definitely are some resources um, out there and definitely a precedent set in 2014 for, for um, success in multiple states here for rivers. Great. All right, good to know. Um, Lisa, any other questions? You know, I don't think I have any other questions. Do we have any others remaining from our uh, attendees? Nope, we do not at this time. So yeah, so I think in uh, starting to have a few people go out. So um, if that's it, we might wrap a few minutes early. Unless Sam, you have a question Hold, you're holding as well. Nope, I will uh, switch back to you. Uh, okay. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, good. Well, I think um, we've had a, a great presentation today, and I really want to thank all of our um, panelists and to Lisa, and look forward to hearing more about all the great things that are unfolding in the Wild and Scenic River's 50th anniversary and going forward, because many of you are working on this as a long-term effort, so there's a lot going available. Please know that this presentation will be online, and as you get off, we will also be sending you a, a very, very short webinar survey. We'd love it if you'd fill that out to help us improve um, for the next time you join us. So I um, hope we'll see some of you at River Rally. And if not, please join us for our next Wild and Scenic Rivers webinar, reaching out to diverse audiences that will be happening in June.
So panelists, and um, we really thank you, and thanks to everyone who attended. And I think for today, that we'll be enough. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you.